Many you have probably read over the years, The Fate of the Badger, I actually read this last year, and to me it really struck me, I think it was written in 1985, but everything that's in here is still relevant today as it was when it was written 30 years ago. Richard has a huge amount of knowledge about the politics, the economics, the science, about our relationship with the Badger and the issue of bovine TB. I think it's a real privilege for us to, to hear from him. He doesn't speak very often, but he's going to give us a real view, I think, about what's happened in his mind since this book was written 30 years ago, where we are today, and what has changed and what hasn't changed. Thank you very much. two very different talks, and I fear mine's going to slump somewhere in the middle of those two. Um, the last time I spoke to a conference was, I think, 1988. Uh, I can't even remember where it was now, because in the 80s I was very busy representing the National Federation of Budget Groups, the precursor to what obviously is now the Trust. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read, more or less, because if I don't, I'm going to lose myself and get out of time, and over and Dominic's going to have to cut me off. Um, Apologise for the lack of graphics, you have seen some very funky graphics just now. Mine are not going to be anything like that, I'm afraid. Um, when I was, uh, hang on, sorry, I'm going on. When I was uh, speaking before, to, actually, I used to think when I was in the 80s, I used to look around the room and think I was like one of the youngest there. Now I look around the room and see that I'm one of the oldest. That's all very well, that's in the nature of things, isn't it? But what's truly scary is in all that time, everything's the bloody same. <laughs> you know? And I use the word in its most literal sense. The, the blood of the innocents continues to be spilt. Um, now, as the scientist in me recoils from words like innocent and guilty, those are value judgments, aren't they? Um, in fact, the, if the badger were guilty of all the crimes laid at its door, including spreading TB and everything else, it wouldn't be guilty, it would be a victim. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I was asked to speak about this book, where it came from, and try to bring it up to present day. Um, <coughs> Can I say at the outset that my story, it's, it's kind of wrapped up in my story, it's quite a personal story this, but again I apologise for that. Um, I think I'm, I'm an example of uh, someone who can give hope to all known hopers. And I must be one of the only uh, people who's got a PhD in science, or well, zoology, probably in science, without even going to know level at school. Uh, so, you know, anything is possible. As I'm, I'm living evidence of that. Uh, school was dreadful. I, I couldn't leave it soon enough. All I wanted to do was play cricket and ride motorbikes and, uh, and paint. And that was all I really wanted to do. Um, <laughs> then I, so I, uh, I, I left, uh, I did my PhD. I did teacher training, which was just as bad. And, and, I, and I left teaching as well. That's primary teaching. I thought, I'll get them at 10 or 11. That's the age to get them. Well, not for me. I obviously didn't have, didn't have the, the appropriate skills. Uh, <clears throat> so at 19, uh, I found myself working for my boyhood hero, Peter Scott, at Swinbridge at the Wildfire Trust. It was, was the Wildfire Trust, it's now the Wildfire, but don't trust me. These things keep changing their names. Um, but it set me off in a career of working in wildlife conservation, particularly in uh, uh, collections breeding or trying to breed rare and endangered species. Um, because the wages were so bad, basically I was a glorified warden. I, well, <laughs> I was called a warden, I was a glorified labourer, really, that, that, was, that was the job. Um, the wages were ridiculously low, and so I tried to uh, bolster my writing by, uh, my wages, by writing. So I wrote um, over the years in 12 books and over 100 articles and papers. Um, but as time went on, I got <coughs> increasingly depressed about the uh, determination of, of rare animals to breed 
think of giant panda, uh, or even lived very often in captivity. So I decided to do my own research. And by that time, I was living in Cornwall, and I got very interested in the extinction then of its national bird, the Cornish chuck. I was very interested to see, I think it was Tom showed a picture of a chuck yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, and it made me think of the Celtic fringe, because the chuck is all the way down the west coast, where I've always lived, and where there's a lot of badgers, obviously, too. There's that one. Um, but I was brought up in North Wales, in Flintshire, and uh, on the county crest of Flintshire, there's four chucks. And um, even though there's no historical record of him ever having lived there, uh, my father was in charge of ancient monuments in North Wales. And I used to go around with him visiting castles and places. And at that time, the uh, custodian at Carnarvon Castle had a tame chuck, which used to wander around the castle grounds. And the chuck uh, lives all along the Reeves on the west, the, the west coast, is Celtic fringe, and also in the quarries in Snowdonia. And it's long been a tradition, or well, it's not anymore, long been a tradition of requiring them to um, keep, they take one chuck, only one, they're quite kind of, you know, responsible like that, rear it and show it. They're very proud of this. Uh, but in the 70s, uh, I was able to, or we were able to, get some of these chucks, which are captured bring them together to try to breed them, to try to re-establish them in Cornwall. Uh, much later, around about the time I started uh, doing my badger work, um, two wild chucks turned up on the Rain Peninsula, just west of, uh, west of Plymouth. And I spent a very cold winter of 1986-87 up there every day studying their behaviour. Um, now you're probably thinking, what's all this got to do with badgers? Fair enough. Uh, well, actually, quite a lot of it happened because uh, at that time, uh, myself and, uh, and some other naturalist friends attended a public meeting in St. Oswald in Cornwall uh, about the persecution of the badger <coughs> by man because of the death rate, as you all know, I'm sure. Um, and from that, we formed Brock, the Cornish Badger Group. Um, at that time, I fondly imagined vets would be our allies. I thought they were scientists, sort of, weren't they? Um, but, uh, of course, they weren't. One or two were. Well, actually, no, more than one or two. A few, a few were very good, but most weren't. Uh, they were very anti-badger. <coughs> Pro-farmer, uh, because the thing, they're paid masters for farmers in the ministry. So that was a problem that we had. But uh, one uh, brilliant vet who was a pathologist for the ministry at the, the Four Wheel BI Centre, is now closed near Truro, um, told me that um, this might this might insult, I don't know, if there's any vets here, I apologise, but it's not me speaking, it's, it's my friend that's vet speaking, said that many vets who fail in private practice join the ministry. So read into that <laughs> what you like. <clears throat> I'm, I'm saying no more. Um, our intention was in Brock <coughs> was always to fight um, the badger slaughter through science, not emotion. Uh, and I still think that's right. <clears throat> um, my, my own feeling is that knowledge is, is gathered uh, by study and wisdom by observation. Um, <clears throat> there was a steep learning curve. And we got instead in the whole dirty political business. Um, we presented evidence to the Dunnett Inquiry and Wildlife Link, which uh, is it still an arm? Yeah, yeah, it's still it's arm of the World Wildlife Link, as it was. Um, it's separate, it's Finchside Wildlife Link, it's a separate NGO. Okay, yeah, fine. Which well, I remember. You remember, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, they supported us very much. And through the efforts of Mark Kawabi, I got a year's contract to work for them as a liaison officer between conservation and farming interests. Mm -hmm. um, the work and stress involved in that alongside my um, uh, my chuff work, we were starting a field study operation on Bobby and Moore. Uh, it very nearly, well in, in the end it did come back, very nearly killed my marriage as well. And I'm sure a lot of you here can, can probably relate to that, the stress involved in doing this work. It was a hell of a time. We were a young family, I desperately needed um, some money and an income. And my agent, remember I'd already written several books, got me a contract to write write this one. That's how it came about. 
It took a year to write, and was published on the 27th of May, 1986. 30 years next year. I'd always intended it to be a good read, <coughs> to balance the, the anecdote with the science, and the, um, what should we call it, the, the whimsy with the brutality. I wanted to try and get a balance. I thought I succeeded pretty well. Um, but unfortunately, the editor who commissioned it left the jump ship halfway through, and um, the academic title who took over wasn't nearly so passionate. This is one of their flies for the book. Um, I had arguments with the designers about the cover. I really didn't like the cover. It looked to me like a museum exhibit. But, uh, I, I didn't believe it. Um, it was from an agency, so I, I got this where it came from. Um, it might be genuine, I don't know. It didn't look it to me. Um, anyway, despite some good reviews and the usual round of TV and radio, um, I think Baxford lost interest in it. So, they cleared some remaining stock to a firm of uh, the field sports concern, actually masquerading as book dealers. <laughs> and uh, they bought a bunch of these books to sell to their customers, their words, to, to see what the opposition, that's us, was up to. <laughs> um, the sale was angry, was an understatement. And uh, my agent made Baxford buy back all the unsold copies. <coughs> So if you've got one of these books, and inside there's a stamp which says Tideline Books, Real, you've got one of those. Okay. <laughs> um, the book was never trashed by our, our opposition, uh, not by math, not even by farmers, the few that is who, who bothered to read it. Um, the only criticism I ever had was for the inclusion of characters from children's fiction in it. Um, but I wanted to show why the Badger is such a, a loved and <laughs> respected figure in the countryside. Why its name crops up in loads of villages and landmarks around the countryside. Um, that, that's what I wanted to do, is to, to be balanced about it. Um, a writer in The Economist talked of the Richard Scarry rule. I don't remember Richard Scarry, those children's books, full of lots and lots of different little pictures. Um, a, bit, a bit politically incorrect now, because it shows women doing the iron and men um, but a writer, this writer said uh, that um, it, this Richard Scarry rule, I mean, propounds uh, that interests which feature heavily in children's books, actually should go on to put that one up, um, the, the um, <coughs> yeah, uh, features which feature heavily in children's books, governments prefer not to challenge. In such books, of course, farms are always rosy cheeked and cheerful. They have a cow and her calf, a pig and her piglets, Chicks running around the sunny clean farm, farmyard, no mention of slaughter, castration, battery production, firing crates, pesticides, muddy overcrowded barns, or of course TV. Uh, but heaven's sake, isn't the badger also for a favourite in children's books? And that, that was really my point. <coughs> anyway, the fledgling, uh, the fledgling Federation of Badger Groups, under the chairmanship of John Taylor, there's no one here I, I remember from those times. I don't, I don't, any, I don't recognize anybody that sounds to me. Um, we re uh, at that time, we were invited to, to join a consultative panel, the, the government's consultative panel. So I represented them for three years, while also doing my, uh, my writing, my PhD, research, and field work. And experiences on that panel were very depressing, to say the least. I mentioned this yesterday. I had very few allies. I don't mind mentioning Colin Booty again because he was the one, the RSPCA, and he was the one solid guy who um, you know, was very, very forthright and very vocal in criticising the, the ministry's policies. Our most vocal support <coughs> uh, outside the panel came from that tri triumvirate of, of redoubtable ladies, Jane Rackford, Nina Sarah Jones, and Ruth Murray. Um, all very different in, in, their, in their very different magnificent in a very different ways. My staunchest ally was Phil Gravel. Um, any of you remember Phil Gravel? <laughs> yes, yes, you do. Um, who frequently phoned me up with a stream of invective, I can't tell you the language, against math. <laughs> uh, he, he was furious. Um, of course, apart from being a TV celebrity and writing his badger books, 
He also wrote for the field, which meant that he had the sort of the ear of our opposition. He was very, very useful in that respect. So sadly now, all those people have departed us. But I think we really do need such intelligent, articulate champions who have the public ear. And we're lucky now to have such high-profile campaigners, aren't we, as Brian May, Peter Egan, George Monbiot, Chris Packham, Simon King, and Dominic here, of course. And we could use a popular countryman, um, a Phil Drabble kind of person. Um, the only person I can think of is, is Johnny Kindle, who is on the TV, I don't know if he's nationwide, but certainly in the South West. Um, is he nationwide? Yeah, I know. Uh, he is a sort of fellow, like him or loathe him, who farmers admire. That's the sort of character I think we need. Uh, okay, mention of intelligence always makes me think of its difference to cleverness. People may be clever, very many are. They may be intelligent, are fewer, my opinion. Um, I suspect that many of you are here today because you're both clever and intelligent. You are the minority. I, I'm convinced of that. You are the minority. That's why it's wonderful to see so many of you here. But I mean, look outside, go into the town, and see how many people are out there who don't feel the cost, do they? It's true. Um, if you were to construct a, a Venn diagram, you know, a Venn diagram, intelligence and cleverness, um, if they overlap to a little small degree, um, you've probably got our political masters. You know. Um, we know who we're talking about. If they overlap to a huge degree, you're probably a genius. You, know, you could be Mozart, Einstein, Beethoven, Rembrandt, Picasso, you know. um, J.S. Bach. And this isn't as irrelevant as you might think. Because I think the world is full of clever beings. Animals are all very clever, aren't they? Uh, that's how they survive, survive in the business. Uh, but none is intelligent, given this, given this theory. Um, I think of a mark of intelligence <coughs> is the ability to hold two opposing thoughts at the same time and still function. Okay? Think about that, perhaps. Uh, and that's why there's such a philosophy of intelligence. But well, then our political masters, and in the case of the Trust, trust, our mistresses. These people have risen to such heights because they are very clever. But none, in my view, is blessed with great intelligence. <laughs> this is our problem. We do have to ask why the bloody killing has gone on for so long. Uh, now the answer, I believe, is intellectual heirlooms. Uh, <clears throat> we've been so much invested in a catastrophic fallacy going right back to the early 70s. Um, that and climbing greasy poles within, within the Ministry of this and political expediency, let's call it. Um, and then this fallacy is rooted in economics. And it still is. And there's no simple way to save face. There's nowhere for them to go. They can't dare, dare not, admit that original fatal error. Goes back to the blame game we were, we were talking about yesterday. Financial consequences and repercussions, if they did a U turn, if the Tories did a U turn, I think would could probably bring down the government. I really think it might. The reason I say that is that um, um, well, one definition of badness is is to keep repeating the mistakes of the past and expecting a different result. That's one definition of madness. Um, the days of Thatcher, I mentioned my mower yesterday, my <laughs> Dr. X, and um, he told me that the decision from Tony and Killing Badgers, this is Thatcher, uh, was taken at number 10. And that someone I was speaking to yesterday reckoned that the same goes on today. I don't know if Dominic probably has a, a better view on that than I do. Uh, but the ministers at that time, that was Peter Walker, I think, at that time, uh, were mere mouthpieces. Now, behind the fallacy, uh, the main issue uh, is who controls the countryside. And that's always been the main issue. And we're talking about establishment, of course. 95% of the countryside is owned by 5% of the population, approximately. Because most of the cabinet, the CLA, and the NFU, this is, this is who 
is our, our masters. I think DEFRA and the NFU are next door neighbours in Smith Square, London. I think they're always popping in and out for coffee and cocktails. I don't know, of course, but that's what I suspect. So mention the NFU brings me to farmers, or more specifically, the agricultural industry, um, which is what they always claim that we do, don't they? We're an industry, it's a business, and we know there's no sentiment or ethics in business. They are, they are inordinately powerful, yet many are supremely ignorant about life beyond the farm gate. Maybe they have to be, as one farmer said to me, staring at the backside of the cow erases your intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> in short, the human population doubled between 1960 and 2000, so they all claim there's all these extra mouths to feed. Yet we have surpluses of land and milk currently. Now, for those who haven't seen it. <coughs> oh, that's one of my other books, I should have shown that. Um, that's a picture of, uh, the name is because uh, I used to write under that name, uh, not Mayo, for long boring family reasons. Uh, that's one of Jane Ratcliffe's uh, cubs, um, and she, she contributed to that book. Written with the help of two vets, good vets. Um, that's another book, translated into French. I have no, I actually had no a legitimate reason to write that book at all. I, I know very little about marine mammals. Uh, it was just one of these jobs, my agent got this job. I wanted to do it with someone else. And he said, no, sure you can do it on your own. Sure you can do it on your own. And it was someone else the wild or someone who said, the best way of learning about a subject, no, phone it to They said, learning about a subject is to write a book about it. <laughs> 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 That's what I did. Okay, this book. Um, I don't know if any of you have read it. Um, I think it's absolutely brilliant. If you haven't, get it from the library or Amazon or something. But um, there's one chapter in there called Sheep Rest. I just want to read you a couple of extracts. It starts off by saying, farming is cited as the reason for the decline of wildlife in Wales in 92% of cases. I, this is Monbio, spent several nights pursuing an explanation for the subsidy rules and the way they are interpreted by national governments, during which I think I think that Peter and Dominic can relate to this, um, during which I was passed from one agency to another. After a long and exasperating correspondence with the civil servants, I secured an audience with the Welsh Minister then in charge of rural affairs, Ellen Jones. I began to understand the nature of the problem when she put down her file of notes on the table and placed beside it the National Farmers Union pen. <laughs> <laughs> Strong as a case for change may be, agricultural hegemony is so potent that to challenge farmers and landowners is almost taboo. In Wales, that's where he lives, <coughs> uh, farmers, both full and part-time, account for 1.5% of the total population and 5% only of the population of the countryside. 44,000 people out of 960,000 rural population. Yet the countryside is governed and managed almost exclusively for their benefit. Many of the ideas and perspectives which dominate rural policy arise with farmers' unions, which are often governed by the biggest and richest landowners. The views of the majority of rural people who are not farmers, 95% in Wales, are marginalised. Ellen Jones was Minister for Rural Affairs, not Minister for Farming. But the pen she brought to our discussion was a cipher for her department's policies. Uh, there's more, but I, I, I don't want to run a short time. But back to my own words. <clears throat> In my opinion, uh, there are two main types of farmers. There's the articulate and possibly intelligent ones we hear on Radio 4, and see on Country Fire if you watch that programme. Um, selected, of course, by the BBC because they are articulate. And there are also the other ones that I worked alongside in the 25 places I've lived and worked at home and abroad. And the farmers I know and see at my local market, and the ones I tried to deal with with Wildlife Link, they're mostly clever, engaging folk. But you have to search mighty hard to find one who can hold two opposing thoughts at the same time and function. And what I tried to talk to about DTB, I uh, replied saying, what's this got to do with you? It's my job. What's it got to do with you? Um, it was as though the heritage of our 
while back in my countryside was of no concern to anyone else. The well-educated, articulate farmer wants, or says he wants, to do the right thing in terms of biodiversity, conservation, GM foods, etc. But most see badgers as weeds. In the same way as a gardener sees a dandelion in a flower border, they are something to be removed and forgotten about, eradicated, vermin. Uh, these farmers have little, if any, conception of ecology or, or webs of life. But when they get together, they're very loud and intimidating um, and macho. <clears throat> and even behind the collars and ties of the NFU, we all know this. So you'll remember my mention of opposition to our work. Well, if this is a game we have to play, let me recommend... Where's my doodah? Let me recommend this. Um, so if any of you have read this book. Uh, it's a very good, it's only a short book, it's a very good book. It's quite balanced actually. Um, it's very harsh, harsh, brutal read, it's not for the squeamish. But it tells what our opposition is up to. Um, 30 years ago, since my book was written and published, I find it incredibly hard to believe. What is even harder to believe is that it's still relevant. It's not just me saying so, it's new people coming to it, reading it for the first time today, to say that it's still relevant. Shouldn't be, should it? Um, so, rounding off on a, how are we doing for time, Tom? Yeah, yeah. Okay. almost there. Okay, so I'll finish now. Um, those of you who follow me on Twitter will know that I now also paint. And this is one of the reasons why, why I haven't been to these conferences for so long. Uh, yes, I was inspired by Peter Scott and seeing his, his lovely paintings and the great art that I've loved ever since my friend who introduced it by my elder brother. Um, but it's also due to badgers, or rather their killers. It's my great. Um, they killed my field study operation, nearly my, nearly my marriage. Uh, and like many of you here, I'm sure, uh, the joy of badger watching now is fraught with how long will I be able to do this for it's been this way since the 70s. In the words of John Milton in Paradise Lost, farewell happy fields where joy forever dwells, pale horrors. I'd like to dedicate this talk to all those who get out in the fields and protest and take their action with the words of Robert Browning, for sudden the worst turns the best to the brave. Mm -hmm. For sudden the worst turns the best to the brave. He was talking about that. Will you allow me, please, just to the conceit of ending with a couple of quotes from my own book. Um, they're how I, how I ended the book, but rest assured, they're not my words. A gamekeeper writing in 1985 said, I would not dream of touching a badger, no matter what he did. He was an English country gentleman before the Normans landed, and he has a right to his place. That was a gamekeeper in 1985. Finally, of course, Kenneth Graham gave these words to Badger. We are an enduring lot, and we move out for a time, but we wait and are patient, and back we come, and so it will ever be. Thank you very much for inviting me, and even more for listening. <laughs>
We know so little about them. They're so inherently important to everything that we share this planet with, but we treat them with utter disrespect and put no value on them. And you're right about intelligence and cleverness. <laughs> I'm afraid many politicians you. don't have to be intelligent. They just have to be clever and ambitious. Mm -hmm. And they get to a point where they can take decisions that have an impact on these things. And the only thing, you're right, that you finish with, the only thing is between them and the destruction of these animals is the people that are willing to go into the fields and stand up for them. So thank you for finishing on that, because it's absolutely crucial, I think, in everything that we're here for. Um, but any points or questions from the audience, just to, to raise, if you want to talk. Please stand up, Dave, sorry. Uh, Richard, um, I've made your excellent book. Um, I know you have some views about how all this started when the first badger was found in 1971 in the farmyard. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, that was John Gallagher, wasn't it, who was yes. the ministry there. And uh, before that, um, before the, the Badgers Act, um, there was so much persecution of badgers that farmers would say that they kept the numbers down. Mm -hmm. The Badger Act, of course, got all the problems because they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're running them off. You see them everywhere. Um, when that badger was found, <coughs> it opened the floodgates. Ah! We've, we've found this solution which brings these two things together, get rid of the badger, and problem solved. Now we know, don't we? I mean, that's all my adult life, pretty much. And where are we now? Yeah. Same arguments, still going on. And it's interesting, the talk which preceded mine, um, yeah, we're still learning such a lot. We know, we should, when you started, I thought, I'm not more badger biology. <laughs> but as we're in touch, I thought, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And we were learning more and more stuff, you know, which was new to me. That video of them moving around underground was, that should go on YouTube. That should go viral. <laughs> 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 it's funny and clever. And, uh, you know, so we're still learning so much. We know, we, we know so little. We still know so little. Any points? Peter, do you want to stand up for that? Well, again, th that was just brilliant. And it was so nice to um, hear so much of actually what I think as well about this and the, that we, we know what the science is and we know the ethics but we keep running up against this cliff wall of tradition and fallacy um, and, and I, no, I notice I, I've, I've written it down the quote was you know so much has been invested in a catastrophic fallacy and I, I think there are two you know the, the one fallacy is that badgers cause TB but the other one I hear all the time is a misreading of Darwinism, and I call it pseudo-Darwinism. So often we hear this expression that um, because man has removed all the predators, we have to act as a predator for every animal. And that's another, that is a sort of nationwide fallacy that people have got into their heads, is that we somehow, is that all animals die through predation, which is a ridiculous idea when you think about it and that all animal numbers are controlled by something bigger, harder, and faster that kills them. That, you know, the world, there would be more predators than prey if that was true, <laughs> if you think about it, if you do the maths, you know, and then they would all die or eat each other, and then there'd be one big fat thing with sharp teeth. <laughs> left. Oh, I feel full. So I think that there's a twin fallacy, and that is that man must kill things because we've killed all the other things that kill things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's all about the and about bringing nature back to it. Exactly, about introducing big predators. Yeah. Because they have a beneficial effect on the countryside, yeah. not yeah. a negative effect. Yeah. So you, get, you can get a copy. If you haven't already read it, and you may as well have done, uh, do try and grab one. Mm -hmm. It's a good reading. It's very informative. Yeah. I'm not his agent. <laughs> <laughs> Any other points people want to raise? Any other questions? One more, okay. Can, uh, Do you want to stand up a moment? Sorry. Yeah, a simple thing to say. It's just <laughs> fantastic to have heard what you've said this morning and all the other talks. So I think all of us in this room must be sidelining other parts of our lives to, to do what we do for badgers. And I know I sometimes feel guilty that my grandchildren are growing up and haven't seen anything like as much of me as they should have done. <coughs> so thank you so much and to everybody else, because I think we so need
get together for this conference once a year to support one another and to realize that, you know, that we're all in it together and we're all fighting to uh, for, for common sense. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it helps me. I sometimes think I normally come to the conference for the whole thing. I only managed to come last night. But uh, it just reinvigorates and makes it realize that we've got to keep on going. And it's all very important. Well, you missed some good stuff yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Thank you very much. Richard.